So why do we need to study the brain? I think the brain is the way in which we interact with the world around us. For instance, it is because of the brain that I know that I have a pointer in my hand and I can barely sort of see that there are people in this auditorium. The brain also allows you to sense if you're hungry or if you're in pain. A key cell in the brain is called the neuron. And here you're seeing a picture of neurons drawn by the very famous Spanish Nobel laureate neuroscientist Ramon y Cajal from over a hundred years ago. And what you see is these cells have long projections which connect to other projections from other neurons. These projections are called axon and this connection between neurons and other neurons and neurons and other cells, usually muscles, forms a wired circuit. And this wired circuit is what your brain and spinal cord in the peripheral nervous system is made up of, which allows you to sense the world around you, integrate that information, and respond to it or transmit information. This transmission of information typically takes place at the ends where one neuron connects to another neuron through chemicals known as neurotransmitter, which are transported in little packets that today are called cargo. I think all of us have a very good experience with what we mean in our lives when we sense, integrate and transmit information. Think about the reflex arcs, which nearly all of you would have studied in a textbook sometime before 10th standard. You walk somewhere, you hit your elbow, or see on a sharp object or a ball. You may feel pain, but you will certainly feel the touch. And you will take a decision on whether to withdraw that arm or to not do so. And that means you're sensing information, integrating that information, and taking a decision and transmitting that information to your arm and whether you're going to move that arm away. There was a lot of interest post World War II. I'm not sure why the image is not showing up here, but I can continue speaking. Post World War II, there was a lot of interest in neurons. And partly because this was a war in which, for the first time, a large number of aeroplanes are used. And in those large number of aeroplanes, which were shot down or fell out of the sky due to crashes, many young people injured themselves, injured their brain, injured their spinal cord when they were very young and had were, for instance, paralyzed. What Paul Weiss and other neuroscientists were interested in is how did the neuron function? And typically, many scientists are interested in the question about how something works. And when you want to answer how something works, the first thing that you do is try to design an elegant experiment. What Paul Weiss did and what you would have seen in this picture is to see this lovely little neuron inside an animal, which is like a wire. And this wire is called the axon where he then went on to try a suture right around it, okay, just like that. Think about a garden hose where you have water flowing and you sort of constrict that pipe with your hand. What would you expect after some time? As the water keeps flowing, if the pipe is flexible, it will sort of expand. And that is precisely what Paul Weiss saw, that you had flow taking place from both directions. There was material flowing in these wires or axon. And that was a pretty powerful experiment to have done. People later on then went on to look much deeper by looking using microscopic techniques. And here you see what happens inside these wires in the axons. That is, you have movement of various cargo. These are little vesicles. Some of these are going to contain neurotransmitters, which allow you to decide whether you want to move your hand or not, for instance, when you bang it. And others, like here, could well be a mitochondria, which generates energy for the neuron. If you look higher micro, with a better microscope in a slightly dissociated preparation, what you see 
are these little cellular roads which are called microtubules along which cargo keep moving smoothly if I might point out. And these cargo are driven by molecular motors and these roads called microtubules are present inside those wires of axon in your brain. And this is very akin to, if you look at this movie and look at all of these other movies, other tracks in which cargo transport takes place, it's really very akin to this drone picture of cargo movement on roads. So let us say, all of this is looking at neurons which you've sort of taken out of the animal, cut to open, teased apart. But you really want to look at transport or movement of cargo inside in a living animal in a non-invasive manner. How do you do that? We do that in our lab by using in our case, a transparent organism called, uh, called C. elegans, which is a nematode, in which we paint cargoes by certain colors using fluorescent proteins. For instance, we can paint all the cars green and all the trucks yellow and so on and so forth. I also want you to think about this comparison to road traffic and hang on to this analogy, which I will visit again. So what you do is you take this little animal, you trap it in a trap it in a microfluidic chamber, turn on light, and then you see cargo movement. You see cargo move in both directions, akin to what Paul Weiss saw with his uh, suture experiment. You also see that cargo did not move, and it's striking how fast and smoothly cargo is moving. In fact, when we drive on regular Indian market roads. That's not our experience. And is that how these narrow axons are? Is they free for movement on both directions? Again, using microscopy, you actually see that's not the case. It's extremely heterogeneous and crowded. So here is an electron microscopic image. You see microtubules along these tracks, which is the road on which cargo move. These are the molecular motors. And you see cargo come in many sizes, and there are a lot of structures nearby beside it. The question is are there any traffic rules in the rocks? Are decisions made that we would not be a Google Maps, which your grandparents would not do? Take out your Google Maps on your smartphone and say, is it red, yellow, or green? And do I decide to leave now based on whether it is red, yellow, green? Alternatively, you could already be on the road and you may not be able to look at Google Maps because you actually should be paying attention to the road by entry if you're driving and not the smartphone and you're going to make local decisions. How do you address these questions? What we do was label two different aspects of our cargo. One is to look at the cargo itself, which is labeled in there. And then the second, which is in green, is filamentous acting is one of those crowding factors that I showed you a picture of. And what you saw with this vesicle is that it comes and stops where there is an active region or where the neuron is physically crowded. It can also stop when one vesicle clashes with another vesicle. What we also found is that many types of cargo stop at the same location, which in effect means that you could have a car followed by an operation, followed by a truck. And this experience, that within neurons, is some similarities between how cargo moves in neurons to what we experience in Indian groups. Surprisingly, this kind of stopping behavior is not restricted to just what happens in a nanometer landscape. Or what we have is an experience with human drivers, which is in the meters next case. Here is an example of an ant which is trying to clear a path to move ahead. There's a forward ant. There are ants which pile up, don't want to get over here, but cannot do so. There is some local squeezing by movement, but it's really not able to move forward significantly. From these cases, we say that there's possibly one unbreakable rule. And that one unbreakable rule is if there is no space in front of you, you cannot move ahead. Or captured in this PT cartoon, if you have 
crowding in front of you which is not going to budge, you cannot move ahead. And this, we think, is one central part of how cargo transport is, uh, uh, is carried out in Europe. But what about getting past traffic congestions in healthy neurons? This is something that we also have to solve. So one simple way was to actually do a simulation experiment, which was done by my collaborator, Dr. Mellon, who's a physicist. And what he did was the following with his team of students. That is, every vehicle that comes does not make any choice. That means if there is crowding or a traffic jam, It'll just come and stop behind it. There's going to be no way for it to go forward. However, if you take a local decision that when you can't move forward, you will actually change your lane of movement, you can restore movement. So local decision in space can be taken where you move your cargo to another path which is much like what an Indian driver would do, or any driver would do anywhere in the world, where they change their lane of motion. You could also do, the simulation suggested, something called reversal, which is again a local decision, and not the Google map version. Here you see a vesicle that's trying to get past actin-rich crowded regions in the axon, and it goes back and forth, and back and forth. And eventually, you'll find that it'll come out at this end. Right there, right? And what you are seeing is a strategy where if you have a crowding in a certain area, instead of just waiting over there, you go back and you sample the same region after a period of time. In time, you try to do some way to see maybe the traffic has cleared up. Is this universal? Yet again, let's look at the ant example. In ants, what happens is you have ants just sitting in the front, not able to go forward. Other ants come up and they realize that it's all clogged up. They start going back. So perhaps it's a universal rule that you can reverse things, takes place, and you don't try to clog yourself up. You wait for that little niche of space to clear up. So what did we learn from our studies? Traffic jams are a feature, not a bug, that arise from the design principles of the neuron. Axons are narrow and thin in geometry. They are physically crowded by lots of cytoskeletal elements, many parallel lanes, as well as other cargo. This leads inevitably to small traffic buildups at various points of time. There is one unbreakable rule. If there is a jam in front of you, you cannot go ahead. There are many strategies to bypass, tra bypass traffic jams in neurons. One is to change your lane or change your microtubule track and so that you're not stuck right there, you make a decision to go elsewhere. And the second is to sample the same space at a different time. This appears to be potentially a universal rule that protein so which move along DNA follow, vesicles that move along microtubule cellular roads follow, that ants follow, and that human drivers follow. And we as humans, and perhaps even proteins inside cells, can add one more complement to it, which is to use something which lets you fly above the traffic and land some distance away. But within neurons, that's not the strategy which is used. Finally, I want to end with one sentence. Traffic jams for any Indian driver are an inevitable fact of life. And we need to be zen about it. Because our own neurons at every moment of time face traffic jams and be very successfully with it. Thank you.